Hey everyone and welcome back to another pre-season NRL Supercoach video from Amman Talks NRL Supercoach. Today we're going to be taking a look at the halfback position, looking at the best guns, min ranges and cheapies to consider when building a team for the 2022 season. So if you guys enjoy the video, really appreciate a thumbs up. Do please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, if you want to see more pre-season content and throughout the season, but let's get straight into it. So firstly, taking a look at the trending halfback position in terms of like average scoring over the past three seasons, we can see that 2021 was a year where we saw a lot more halfbacks kind of coming into that top 20. So one name is constant though in the last three seasons, Nathan Cleary, Nathan Cleary, Nathan Cleary. You can see a 68 average in 2019, 83 in 2020, and then a 108 in 2021. It's going to get in 2022. Uh, I'll leave that up to you. But I do think that he is clearly the standout halfback to go for in Supercoach. And the stats that we're going to take a look at really do back that up. And so I think he is a big question mark as well if he's going to be available for round one. But if he is fit for round one, you know, coming back off his shoulder injury and the signs do look like that, he will be ready for round one. He probably will be the standout halfback to go for. He is extremely expensive, but I think these numbers do show you that he is the best halfback in Supercoach, and I don't expect that to change anytime soon for this season as well, as he gets better and better playing for one of the best teams in the competition. But we just see the likes of Cherry Evans, Luke Keery, and also Jerome Hughes. Luke Keery was a small sample size of only about three games in 2021, but Jerome Hughes and Cherry Evans making their way onto the list there. So I think there are a few good gun halfback options that we can consider. We historically haven't seen that many halfbacks come into the top 20, but I do think it leaves you a little bit more flexibility, potentially if Cleary was out, to go for some kind of lower owned pod options. But I do think that Cleary, if he's available, he is a standout to go for. But we'll take a look at the guns just now. So if you weren't sure as to why Cleary is the best halfback to go for in Supercoach, these stats probably do paint a better picture of that. You can see how much better he was in comparison to the next best gun halfbacks. And most of that is just due to how much scoring he gets done. Because playing for the Panthers, obviously he's very crucial to that team, but they score so many points and the fact that he's goal kicking and usually he's so involved that he's setting up a lot of those tries as well. So you can see his create and his scoring averages are just so much higher than the next best. So Cherry Evans at 32 uh, in the create category, then Adam Reynolds for the scoring category of 23, who's also a very prolific goal kicker. So it just shows how good Cleary is as a super coach option. And you can also see how consistent he is in the table below me. So what you can see there is a percentage of times that this particular player scored over 60 points and CV refers to coefficient or variance. So I'm gonna start using this for a lot of the attacking players because Kind of what, what we want to see with attacking players is how kind of consistent they are because the forwards tend to be more consistent in general but the backs if we can get a little bit more consistency out of them that is a good sign so 94 percent of the time cleary scored over 60 some fun stats for you though 87 and a half percent of the time he scored over 70 81 percent of the time he scored over 80 uh, and 50 percent of the time he scored over 100 and this was in a sample of 16 games so it just shows you like i don't need to say it anymore i think he is the standout 950k i think what he also offers is great captaincy material because he is so consistent as i mentioned so if he's fit for round one and you're not going to be able to fit in the likes of Tom Dvorovich, for example, I do think Cleary week in, week out is a standout captaincy option. And so I think even though you are paying so much more for him compared to the other halfbacks, the other halfback is going to give you this consistency plus the point scoring. And in the little table I've got to the right of the kind of bar chart, I've put together a bit of a ranking of their draw of the first six rounds of the season based on my own kind of fixture ticker. And so the Panthers come out on sixth, bearing in mind that the Panthers are a top team in the competition, even though their draw isn't like, you know, first or second, I still think that's a very good draw on paper for the Panthers to start. So clearly, I think if you sit for round one, I'm going to try to force them into my team, I think, even if there is a slight risk, just because either that or you probably need to make a plan, I think, to have him. And so taking a look at the rest of the halfbacks, I think this is where it gets really interesting. In the event, say that Cleary's not fit for round one, I think it's too difficult to kind of keep him on the bench at that amount of price. Terry Evans was the next best halfback uh, in terms of super coach point scoring. But as you can see there, for the first six weeks of the season, Manly don't have the best draw on paper. They're ranked 12th in my opinion. And a tendency that I've noticed with Cherry Evans is that he tends to score a lot of his kind of biggest scores. He does have good upside, but I feel like they come towards the back end of every season and not necessarily at the beginning of the season. So for example, in 2020, he had 300 plus scores and they all came after round 12. And in 2021, I believe he had about six or 700 plus point scores and around five of them came after round eight. So potentially, I don't necessarily know if there's too much to kind of buy into that. Maybe you could argue that he's a bit of a slow starter. He is a bit more inconsistent as well. You can see there, the 0 0.55. So I should also mention that that CV number, the lower, the better. And so obviously Cherry Evans is at 0 0.55. So it's quite high in comparison to a lot of the other halfback options here. And 59% of the time he does score over 60 points. But when he does score big, he goes really big. He definitely does have that yeah, pedigree to be able to score 100 plus. So I don't mind going for Cherry Evans, but 
the draw does put me off when they've got the Panthers and the Roosters in the first two rounds of the season. So come round three, uh, when prices will change, you could expect his price to go down. So I'm not too keen on starting with Cherry Evans. It's a similar story as well, I think, with Nico Hines. Nico Hines was fantastic last season as well when he was playing at fullback for the Melbourne Storm. He's obviously moved to the Sharks. We're not 100% sure if he's still going to be goal kicking with the likes of uh, Trindle, um, potentially also being able to play at halfback, and he's a pretty good goal kicker himself. So Hines, if he loses the goal kicking, and I think the biggest kind of downside is that he's not going to be playing at fullback. If you've seen a few of my videos, you might have seen me mention that the fullbacks traditionally score the most in terms of super coach points because they're so involved. It's kind of the role of the modern fullback. And so him playing in the halves, I don't think is going to be quite as effective from a super coach point of view if instead he was playing at fullback. Combine that with the fact that he's now moved to a lesser team compared to the Melbourne Storm, 686k I think is, you know, you're paying top dollar for someone like Hines. And I think well, there's a few question marks around him. If he's goal kicking, they'll make me consider him a little bit more. But the fact that he's playing in the halves instead of fullback and, you know, maybe slightly adjusting to new teammates and a new system, I'm just not quite sure if I could uh, shell out that amount of money for Nico Hines. Uh, Jerome Hughes, I do believe, is the kind of next best gun halfback to go for from the beginning of the season specifically if Cleary is unavailable. A couple of reasons for that. He's got pretty solid base there. You can see 27 and overall he's just a very consistent option. He does also have some upside. I think he scored three times over 100 in 2021 and you can see the consistency in the table below me. 73% of the time he scored over 60 um, and a very low uh, CV of 0.36. So kind of again what I mentioned. Pretty consistent. He's not going to really give you those bad scores. What I do like as well is in round one in particular, the Melbourne Storm do versus the West Tigers. There won't be any Harry Grant or Cam Munster due to suspension. So you could argue this in two ways. Are the Storm going to be as effective without key playmakers? Or is Hughes going to take on a bigger role and potentially have a really, really big start to the season in a pretty friendly matchup against the Tigers? That's why I'm thinking very specifically for round one. If Cleary was out, I probably would just go with Jerome Hughes. He's probably got the best match in that particular instance. And over the first six weeks, the Storm do have a nice run of games as well. So he's still someone that you're probably comfortable holding as well for the first kind of six rounds of the season, if not any longer than that as well. He proved to be a very good option last season. So Jerome Hughes, I'm very confident on. We'll probably have another good season. Don't necessarily see him doing so much better than what he did last season. But I think if you're just going for kind of a, you know, maybe you're a bit of a placeholder for Nathan Cleary, I think Jerome Hughes will do very well at the beginning of the season. And definitely it will always peak interest as well throughout the year. I'll quickly touch on Ben Hunt, but in all honesty, I'm not too keen on Ben Hunt at 590k. One reason for that is he has lost his dual flexibility. Last season, you were able to pick him up in the hooker or in the halfback position, but he is playing in the halfback solely now for the Dragons. So I don't really see, you know, the things like the base probably won't be as high, um, even though if he was potentially playing at hooker. The upside is not quite there. I think with Ben Hunt, you can see only 53% of the time he scored over 60 points. And the Dragons have a really, really tough run to begin the season. You can see they're the worst ranked, uh, in my opinion, for the first six rounds of the season. So I think it's quite a lot of money to pay for Ben Hunt. So I'm not particularly looking to go there and I probably wouldn't recommend him either. Sam Walker and Luke Keery definitely do interest me couple of reasons. So the Sydney Roosters do have a very nice run of games to begin the season. Not necessarily from rounds one to three, but more so from rounds around four to nine. So there's a really nice long-term stretch for the Roosters that they've got a nice run of games. And so I've got them ranked fifth for the first six games of the season. Sam Walker, we saw the downside with him was that he was very inconsistent. You can see there the CV for him, 0.66. That's actually the highest of all of these halfback options. And 56% of the time, he scored over 60. The times when he didn't score over 60, they were quite low scores. And that tended to be due to his low base. You can see that his base of only 16, he really relied on the kind of creative and attacking stats. And if they're just not quite coming for him, he was obviously playing in his rookie season. So maybe a good off season, uh, a little bit more training as well in the preseason. He might be better equipped as well in the system. So we potentially might see those attacking stats be a little bit more sustainable. And if he maintains the goal kicking as well, that's a big question mark for the Roosters in general. Sam Walker was goal kicking at a period of time, but he wasn't the best goal kicker. Momorowski has now come to the team. He potentially could be goal kicking as well. If Sam Walker is goal kicking, I really do like it for that price of 546k um, with a really nice run of games to begin the season. So Sam Walker, I'm very keen on. And Luke Curie, I think is a really interesting uh, point of discussion because he only played three games all of last season. So he's just coming back from a pretty significant ACL injury. He is dual listed as well. So you can also pick him up at the 5 and the halfback position. I'll put a little asterisk next to Kiri's name. So instead of presenting his 2021 stats, because he only played three games, I didn't think they would be telling the best story because it shows that his average is like 75, but he was versing pretty easy opponents. So I've actually just put his 2020 stats, which I think give a better kind of sample size where he was playing the majority of the season. So he was pretty steady. He was averaging around 59. What he tends to do as well is he also blows hot and cold. So he does have very high upside. 
but his base also isn't the best there. You can see at 19, so he tends to have a, quite a few scores um, under 60 as well. You can see 61% of the time he scored over 60, so it's just not quite at that level of like a Jerome Hughes or like a Nathan Cleary as well. But for that price and the dual flexibility, I can see why he is very popular to begin the season. I'm also very tempted. I do think the Roosters are going to be a team to target potentially for the early season. I think getting Kiri back is very important for their system. It would mean that they start the season really well. Obviously, they've still got the likes of Tedesco, Sam Walker, and they're just a well-coached team as well by Trent Robinson. So the Roosters, I am keen on. You're probably going to hear me mention this quite a few times, I think, in the preseason videos. Kiri, I do like. Maybe as a bit more of a pun, but I think if you want more, a bit more of a surety, maybe you potentially just go for a Jerome Hughes, although that is a pretty significant price uh, increase to Jerome Hughes. So Kiri, for a bit of a punt, I, I don't really mind that at all. Now, Mitch Moses and Adam Reynolds, I kind of put them in the same kind of category. So they're very similarly priced, only a 1K difference. You know, they're both the goal kickers for their respective teams. So Adam Reynolds has also now moved to the Brisbane Broncos. So you'd argue they're a much worse team than the likes of the Rabbitohs. Um, and obviously you can see the majority of Adam Reynolds point scoring comes from his goal kicking um, and the scoring. Now, my main argument is that are the Broncos actually gonna score as many points as the Rabbitohs? Probably not. Although it does beg the question, do the Rabbitohs score as many points without Adam Reynolds? But they still do have star playmakers. As the Broncos are still gelling together a few new options. So I think Reynolds, I can only see his scoring either staying the same or going down. So I just don't see any kind of upside with him. You can see in the table below me, the consistency is not bad, you know, 0.38 but not too many scores uh, over 60 points. So I don't really think I'd be uh, encouraging going for Adam Reynolds, especially when he's in a new team. And a similar story with Mitch Moses. He had one good super coach season, but last season, again, very, very steady in terms of, you know, not too many scores over 60 points. You can see only 35% of the time there. Consistency was okay at 0.5 in terms of the ratio, but it just doesn't excite me, you know, going for Moses or Reynolds. I do think there are other, other better options as well in the gun halfback category. Cleary, obviously a standout, but as I kind of touched on, I really like Jerome Hughes, Sam Walker, and uh, Luke Cleary as well, if you're looking in the gun category. Now, next up, taking a look at the mid-range. Now, I do think this is an interesting kind of price bracket that we could potentially target as well um, in the halves. So if Cleary is, for example, not available, I think you could potentially look at the price category to save quite a bit of money and use that money to stack like your fullbacks, maybe even potentially afford uh, a Tom Trevojevic. So there's a few options that I wanted to highlight here. Um, don't laugh at me, anyone, but I've got Luke Brooks there because I do think Luke Brooks was actually, he was posing some decent scores last season. I tended to notice he was pretty consistent as well. So you could make the argument that he was consistently bad. You know, only 38% of the time he was scoring over 60. So not too many scores above that kind of category that you'd probably want to see, um, you, know, you know, your halfback get. He is obviously priced at a lower average as well at 476k. The reason I put him there is potentially he could get goal kicking now that Dewey's going to be out for quite a while. I think we suspect to begin the season. And so if he's goal kicking, maybe there's some upside. The downside though is that the Tigers do have a pretty tough run to begin the season. I've got them ranked at 14. Consistency from Brooks probably just comes from that base. So his, you can see there the base of 25 a game is pretty solid. But yeah, in, in good faith, I don't know if I could recommend Brooks, but I kind of did want to present him as an option, maybe if he gets the goal kicking. Sean Johnson, I think, is going to be very high up on a lot of players' radars, and for mine too as well. The downside is that the base is just not there. You can see 15 a game he was averaging, and he obviously has been affected by injuries in the past few seasons as well, so he's probably not quite getting into the mix of things in terms of tackles um, and runs. I feel like those injuries potentially do play on my mind as well. We're not going to see probably the explosiveness from Johnson. You can see there, only 40% of last season he scored over 60 points. He was quite consistent as well at 0.39. But we were seeing a lot of scores just kind of around that 55 to 60, not too many higher than that. He also lost a goal kicking at one point in the Sharks. Now, he could potentially goal kick at the Warriors, but I do have a feeling that Reese Walsh, the fullback, will continue goal kicking. Johnson, without goal kicking, is not as appealing. Obviously, that scoring stay the same. The creator stats, I think, is really where he's going to get the bulk of his points moving forward. You know, he's got good forwards around him, and he potentially can put them through holes and get quite a few line break assists, try assists. The benefit of the Warriors as well is that they've got a really nice run to begin the season. I've got them ranked second to begin the first six weeks of the season. I think that's probably the main reason that you might go for Sean Johnson is that just potentially target those first few early weeks, hope that he can score above his kind of priced average, um, and then he might make some early coin for you, and then you can maybe move him on after the Warriors' uh, nice run has ended. So Johnson, I don't mind overall, but I do still have a few question marks. 
and to be honest, I'm going to have question marks with most players. I think I'm not. There's no real dead certs apart from like Cleary, to be honest. But Johnson, I don't think you can go too much worse, particularly in this price category. Now, Toby Sexton is an interesting one as well. He only had a four-game sample size from last season, so the stats might be a little bit skewed, especially because he also played pretty favorable opposition in his four games. I've just got them up here. So he played the Dragons, the Bulldogs, the Cowboys, um, and then the Rabbitohs. And notably, he scored 32 points in that game against the Rabbitohs. And then the other three, it was 83, 67, and 66. So he did definitely kind of target and fare better in those games where he was versing easier opposition. To be honest, that's what you do expect um, out of most attacking players. Uh, the benefit with Sexton was that he was goal kicking. You can see that's how a lot of his points were scored. If you look at that scoring bracket, it's a lot higher than the likes of Johnson and Brooks, who obviously weren't scoring you know, a goal kicking that much. Um, pleasingly, the base was also quite good for Sexton at 25, and the Titans don't have too bad of a run to begin the season. I've got them ranked 8th, but potentially if you're not going to go with Cleary, I don't mind taking a stab at someone like Toby Sexton to begin the season, especially because there's so many question marks around other options. You could instead use that opportunity from going to Cleary all the way down to Sexton, and that frees you like maybe 500k. And that could be the difference between having like Tedesco at fullback and to uh, Tom Tvojevic. So I think there is definitely room and opportunity for Sexton to be in our teams. Obviously, you can argue that it's only a four game sample size. Can we trust that? But the fact that he scored well against easier opposition. I think shows you that maybe, you know, Titans overall, a uh, pretty good attacking team. I don't think they have any difficulty actually scoring points. Conceding points, though, they tend to be a little bit uh, weak at the back. But Sexton is, a, is an attacking player, so we don't really care about how much the Titans concede. We just want them to be scoring points. And so in that four-game sample size, you know, pretty consistent at 0.3, but it's definitely a punt. And I think you just have to accept that when you're purchasing Sexton. Um, you know, between Johnson and Sexton, Johnson has the pedigree, and he has the better draw on paper. For that reason, I'd probably sway just towards uh, Sean Johnson, but if you're looking to save an extra 20k, uh, I don't mind taking a stab at Sexton either. Now, I've also got Braden Trindle here. Now, you might be asking yourself, why has he been listed here twice? Reason is that he spent a lot of last season actually being played off the bench in like a 17 or a number 14 role. But I wanted to also show his stats when he was just actually playing at the halfback position. Now, I will caveat as well that the times that he was playing either 5'8 or halfback was towards the end of last season. And that's when the Sharks had a really nice run of games. So the only really kind of tough opposition that he played when he was actually starting was the Melbourne Storm in round 25. And so the scoring really kind of does reflect that. But he had a very nice average in that period of time. You know, you can see it was really peaking at around 71, I believe it is. Um, he was goal kicking as well. So the scoring bracket really jumped up in that period of time. And the creativity as well, because he was getting a lot of try assists and line break assists, things like that as well. You can see the base, though, not the best for someone like Trindle. And we're not actually certain if he's going to be starting. I suspect he would be starting, but anyone who's a Sharks fan, let me know in the comments below. Uh, maybe I haven't done all my research. But the reason I wanted to kind of highlight the difference is that, you know, when the Sharks get a nice run of games, um, and potentially if he is starting in the halves and if he's goal kicking, I do think that he is an option uh, that we can consider, but I can't really vouch for him unless we get further information as well about his security in the team moving forward. And finally, Jackson Hastings at the Tigers. So as I highlighted with Brooks, the Tigers don't have the best run to start the season. It has been word that Hastings will goal kick for the Tigers while Dewey is out. And I think if Hastings is goal kicking at 350k, I really do like that. There is some potential for him to actually, you know, make some money for us as well at the beginning of the season, which is very important. Stats that I've got for Hastings is from 2016 when he was averaging around 52 for the Roosters. And so he has obviously got some pedigree of you know decent scoring. It was quite a while ago, but I still think Hastings with goal kicking could be a good mid-range option as well. And I think you're going to see him in quite a few teams if he does have the goal kicking. If he doesn't have the goal kicking though, that might potentially limit his ceiling, especially with that tough run of games to begin the season. In that case, I probably would maybe opt to go for Johnson or Sexton in that mid-range price category for the halfback slot. Now, finally, at the cheapies, it's pretty straightforward, actually, with the halfback position, who the kind of cheapies are. So I've got Taff and Ilias, both actually from the Rabbitohs. Now, the reason I've got both of them is that it's not 100% certain yet who's going to replace Adam Reynolds at the halfback position. Uh, the reports are that potentially Ilias is the front runner. So Ilias, you can see there, he actually did play one game at halfback for the Rabbitohs last season, and he scored 39 points, which, to be honest, for a 205k cheapie, if he gives us a 39 average, he will make us some money. So he probably is going to be the best halfback cheapie to go for. Fortunately, he is also dual listed, so you can also pick him up in the 5-8 cheapie slot as well. So that really is handy with Ilias. So I do think that he's going to be a very, very, very popular cheapie if he is named to start for the Rabbitohs. Taff is there just in case he potentially gets the slot. Taff also is listed at fullback because for the first couple of rounds of the season, Latrell is going to be suspended. So you could go with Taff. I guess the window of opportunity for Taff will definitely be limited if it's just for the two games. You won't even be able to get a price rise out of him. The only exception is that 
Potentially, he plays so well at fullback that they're then moving to the halfback position when the trolls back and then forcing out Ilias. But I think it's probably safer just to start with Ilias. Um, if Taf ends up being the cheapie to get, then just make the swap, I think, at that point in time. There's only a 5k price difference between them. One cheapie I haven't included here is Ezra Mam uh, from the Broncos. I'll probably talk about him a little bit more in the 5.8 video, but I don't really think there's too much to add. It's more just about the fact that does he get a starting place? If he does, then he's also a great cheapie to go for, and he is 175k. But I think Ilias is the standout halfback cheapie to go for. All right, guys, that is my run through of the halfback position for the 2022 Supercoach season, looking at the guns, mid ranges, and cheapies. Hopefully, you guys found some value out of that video. If you did, really appreciate a thumbs up. Do please consider subscribing as well to the channel. Any questions or comments, definitely leave them below. I read all the comments and love hearing the interaction from you all out there as well. And I'll see you all in the next video.